You know, people say evolution is not a bad philosophy, but at the same time, it was Hitler's religion during the Third Reich in Germany. Hi, my name is Eric. In this next seminar, Dr. Hoven exposes some of the terrible things that have been done in the name of evolution. Because dictators throughout time have used the evolutionary ideas to support their brutal tactics. I taught high school science for 15 years, and now for 14 years I've been an evangelist traveling and doing seminars on creation, evolution, and dinosaurs. And tonight we're going to share with you some of the dangers of this evolution theory. I don't leave my gorgeous wife and travel every week of the year because I like being gone. <laughs> Folks, this is an, evolution is not just a dumb idea, it's a very dangerous philosophy. I've only got three things I want to cover, but it's probably going to take several nights to do that. First of all, I want to tell you what on earth is happening. And secondly, why is the evolution theory dangerous, and what do you do about it? Pretty simple. Okay, what is happening? Tonight, as I speak, our president is announcing we're about to go blow up Iraq, I believe, right? The world seems to be coming unglued at the seams. There are wars and rumors of wars every place we look. Why on earth would Joseph Stalin order the execution of 14,700 Polish prisoner of war officers? I thought there was a Geneva Convention. Why do you order the execution of prisoners of war? Why did Hitler order the execution of nearly six million Jews plus others? Why did Paul Pot, later in the Cam Cambodian Khmer Rouge, order the execution of one-third to one-half of his entire population, his own people? He killed them. Why? Why would somebody do that? Why would the Australian Aborigines be rounded up like cows and shot so their heads could be put in museums years ago? Why would somebody do that? Why did Kip Kinkle murder his parents, two other classmates, and shoot 26 other ones? Why would a student do that? Kip said, if there was a God, he wouldn't let me feel the way I do. There is no God, only hate. On May 21st, 1998, 15-year-old Kip Kinkle, a student at Thurston High School, that's in Oregon, near Eugene, allegedly entered the school cafeteria and fired more than 50 rounds from a semi-automatic rifle. 26 students were injured. Two killed. Later, the bodies of his parents were found in his home. He was then arrested and taken to a police headquarters where he attempted to murder a detective during his questioning. Kip said, if there was a God, he wouldn't let me feel the way I do. There's no God, only hate. Why have we had a nearly a 1,000% increase in violent crimes since I was a boy? I remember the days when you did not have to lock your house. We'd go off on vacation for two weeks. Wouldn't even, I, I never had a key to my house growing up. Never did have a key. I don't know if it even had one. You didn't need one in those days. Why would there be such a horrendous increase in unwed birth rates and so much of our moral structure is just simply unraveling? What on earth is happening? Dylan and uh, Eric, Her Eric Harris and Dylan Klebold made a videotape prior to the Columbine shootings. On that tape, they said, talking about one of the football players, he doesn't deserve the jaw evolution gave him. Look for his jaw. It won't be on his body. Hmm. Those, these two boys were very strong believers in evolution. They did the shooting on Hitler's birthday on purpose. They shot Isaiah Scholes just simply because he was black. They shot Cassie just because she believed in God. Same thing with Rachel. What happened? Why, why would somebody do this? What's going on in our thinking? Well, the newspaper article in Columbine High School said, the clothes may give a clue to the thinking of these teenagers. The autopsy said one of the boys' shirts said natural selection on the front. Interesting. Textbooks used in Escambia County, Florida, this textbook, says evolution and natural selection go together. Hmm. This textbook says natural selection causes evolution. Well, just what is this natural selection? Oh, you see, Adolf Hitler thought he would speed up the process by eliminating the inferiors. Hitler honestly thought he was doing the world a favor. So did Joseph Stalin. So did Paul Pott. Why do people do these things? So what is wrong with our thinking? Right after the Columbine shooting, almost instantaneously, five more students from within the Springfield School District were arrested for threatening to murder students. 
principals, or teachers. In the adjacent school districts, more students were arrested for violent threats, and in one case, an elementary schoolboy shot five of his classmates with a BB gun. Could it possibly be that what we're teaching them is causing this behavior? You know, what you believe determines how you behave. If you're raised up in a head-hunting society, and you're taught from the time you're a boy, if you go off to war and shoot somebody, you ought to kill him and cut off his head and uh, eat the brains because you get his spirit. I mean, if you really believe that, guess what you're going to do when you go off to war? <laughs> you're gonna, you, you, your behavior is determined by your beliefs. What you believe determines how you behave. It's always been that way, and it's no different today. Could it be that this evolution theory is to blame? This textbook says, you're an animal and share a common heritage with earthworms. Question. If evolution is true, how are the kids supposed to tell right from wrong? I spoke in a public school in Pennsylvania one time. A kid sat on the second row and he said, Mr. Hovind, I'm an atheist. I said, really? He said, yep, there is no God. I said, well, tell me, son, are you sure? He said, yep, I'm sure. I said, well, son, do you know everything? He said, no. I said, do you know maybe half of everything? He said, no. I said, okay, well, let's just pretend that you know half of everything. Is it possible that God exists in the other half you don't know? Brand new thought rattled around in his brain for a while and got lost, I believe. I said, by the way, son, if there's no God, how do you tell right from wrong? He said, oh, that's easy. He said, I determine what's right and wrong. He said, I'm the God of my own universe. I said, I'm glad to hear about that, son, because I'm going to shoot you in five minutes. He said, you can't do that. I said, oh, yeah, I can. You see, I'm the God of my own universe. And I decided it's fine for me to shoot you. Question, exactly how do we tell right from wrong? In the first couple of seminar tapes, we talked about a variety of topics like the Big Bang Theory, how it's a big dud. We talked about the Garden of Eden, and we talked about why the earth cannot be billions of years old, and why did the people live to be 900 years old before the big flood came. We talked about dinosaurs, and students are being lied to about dinosaurs. They did not live millions of years ago. And on tape number four, we talk about a whole bunch of lies in the textbooks. Now here we're going to talk about what's happened in the last 150 years since evolution became a popular theory. What on earth is happening? And what you can do about it? We'll get to that eventually. We're going to review some of what we covered on tape number four, some of the lies in the textbooks, and then go on into how it carries into some practical steps we can take. What do you do about it? We covered in the last sessions how that James Hutton wrote a book in 1795, and he said the earth is millions of years old. Now during the late 1700s, most folks believed the Bible. And most folks thought the earth was about 6,000 years old. Because if you add up the dates in the Bible, you're going to get about uh, 6,000, 4,000 B.C., not millions. So James Hutton came along and caused people to doubt the earth was 6,000 years old. Then his book had a very strong influence on a lawyer from Scotland named Charles Lyell. Charles Lyell wrote a book in 1830. And in his book, he developed what we call today the geologic column. Cenozoic, Mesozoic, Paleozoic, and you know, maybe you saw the movie Jurassic Park, named after the Jurassic layer. This whole thing was made up by Charles Lyell in 1830. And the geologic column does not exist any place in the world, except in the textbooks. It's pure imagination. It doesn't exist. But all of evolution theory is based on that dumb geologic column, made up in 1830. This fellow said, I myself have little doubt that in England it was the long age uniformitarian geology and the theory of evolution that changed us from a Christian to a pagan nation. He's right about that. And England is a pagan nation. And folks, I don't know if America ever was a Christian country or not, but it's not now. Right. We are a pagan nation also. What has happened? Charles Lyell's book had a very strong influence on a young preacher named Charles Darwin. Darwin graduated from Bible college to be a preacher. In 1859, after 22 years of writing, Darwin finally published his book, The Origin of Species. We'll get into more of that later, the real title to the book. Darwin's philosophy was strongly influenced by people like Charles Lyell, people like Thomas Malthus. Malthus had written a book that said, there are more babies born than can possibly survive, so it's best if the weakest die off. That greatly influenced people like Charles Dickens when he wrote the Christmas Carol. Remember the scene in there where Scrooge said, well, if he's going to die, let him die, then decrease the surplus population. Remember that line in there? You can, I don't think you can understand the Christmas carol, the history behind that, until you understand how evolution ties in. James Hutton's book made people doubt the earth was 6,000 years old. Along came Charlie Lyell, and people began to doubt the flood. 
Because instead of the flood making all those layers, they said, oh, maybe each layer is a different age. And then along came Charlie Darwin, and people began to doubt the Creator. And so by the mid-1800s, the Western world at least, was left with in, a, in a bad situation. They said, well, if there's no God, who's in charge? Well, it uh, must be us. This led directly to the rise of humanism. Humanism is the teaching that there is no God, so we must be God. We make the rules. We decide what's right and wrong. For the next 50 years, after Darwin's book came out, many isms arose in the world. Marxism, Nazism, Communism. These things, Communism would have been just a footnote in a history book if it hadn't been for evolution coming along at the right time. We never would have heard of Communism, most of us wouldn't, if it hadn't been for Charles Darwin coming along and giving justification to that dumb idea of Communism. Hoyle said, I'm haunted by a conviction that the nihilistic philosophy, which so-called educated opinion chose to adapt adopt following the publication of The Origin of Species, committed mankind to a course of automatic self-destruction. A doomsday was then set ticking. I agree, Fred. Once you start believing there's no God and we're in charge, then we're in trouble. There was a Russian atheist astronomer who came to America one time and he spoke at one of the universities and he said, now folks, either there is a God or there isn't. I thought, boy, this guy's brilliant. <laughs> but then he said, both possibilities are frightening. I thought, wow, oh, that is brilliant. You see, if there is a God, we better find out who He is and find out what He wants and do what He says. Amen. If there is no God, we're in trouble because we're hurtling through space at 66,000 miles an hour and nobody's in charge. Pretty scary thought. Charles Darwin said, Often a cold shudder has run through me as I have asked myself whether I may have devoted myself to a fantasy. Well, Charlie, you did devote yourself to a fantasy. If you believe you came from a rock 4.6 billion years ago, you need help. You were designed for a purpose. Now, what is it? There are four great questions that every single religion in the world tries to answer. Even atheism, which is a religion, you have to believe there is no God. There's no way to know that. The four great questions every religion tries to answer. Who am I? Where did I come from? Why am I here? And where am I going when I die? The way you answer these questions depends upon how you view the world. There are basically only two ways to look at this world. One view says, you know, there's incredible design, there must be a designer. That's the creationist worldview. Other people look at the world and say, you know, nobody made it. It just made itself. They don't believe God created the heaven and the earth. They think a big bang made this world from nothing. That's called the humanist worldview. It just made itself. The first plank in the Humanist Manifesto in 1933 was, the universe is self-created, self-existing and not created. That's the first thing they have to agree to, to be a humanist. There's now been Humanist Manifesto 2 in 1973 and Humanist Mas Manifesto 3 in the year 2000. They attempt to declare what they believe. Humanism is a religion. You have to believe there is no God. So why is this theory dangerous? Evolution, I am convinced after studying this now for 30 some years, evolution is absolutely the foundation for communism, Marxism, Nazism, socialism, racism. We'll get into some more of that in a minute. Number one, I think evolution is dangerous because it's bad science based on lies. There is no scientific evidence to back up this evolution theory. We've been offering $250,000 for a long time at our ministry for somebody who could give us some real scientific evidence for evolution. It is funny, brother, to see the people try to turn stuff in. One guy said, I've got proof for evolution. I said, really, what do you have? He said, well, I'm working in the laboratory right now and we have developed soybean plants that are resistant to frost. I said, man, that's good. That'll really be handy. I said, what did you start with? He said, well, um, soybean plants. I said, oh, what do you have now? He said, I've got a whole new species. I said, of what? Of a soybean plant. <laughs> I said, I'm sorry, sir. That's not evolution, okay? That's a variety of a soybean plant. And it's interesting, and I'm glad you're able to do that. But that's not evolution. There is no evidence whatsoever that any animal ever produced a different kind of animal. So why would anybody believe such a dumb idea? And how can this be so dangerous? Well, we'll cover some of the isms in just a minute. But evolution is based on lies and bad science. There is no good science to back it up. This textbook says, evolution is a fact. Evolution is a fact, not theory. Birds arose from non-birds and humans from non-humans. No person who pretends to any understanding of the natural world can deny these facts any more than she or he can deny that the earth is round, rotates on its axis, and revolves around the sun. Sounds like he's open-minded for a discussion, doesn't it? 
This is not a fact, folks. Evolution is a mantra. They say this over and over and over, hoping it will become true. It's, that's all it is. They just keep repeating it. Oh, hope, evolution's a fact, it's a fact, it's a fact. Well, you better define what you're talking about with evolution. We do that on videotape number four, the six different meanings of this word evolution. This textbook says, evolution has evidence from fossils, from structure, from molecular biology, from development. Any evidence that's used to support evolution has been proven wrong. Now, I've said many times, I'm not trying to get evolution out of the schools, I just want the lies out of the textbooks. We almost got a bill passed in Arkansas a couple of years ago, and I went up to Arkansas and testified before the Senate, before the House Representatives Committee that was looking at this bill, HB 2548, I believe it was. And it was, the bill simply said, Arkansas will not use tax dollars to purchase materials if they contain knowingly fraudulent information. We're not going to buy books that have lies in them. And it gave a few examples, like some of the examples I gave in my seminar. If it says the embryo has gill slits, we're not going to buy it. I stood up and testified for 45 minutes before this committee. After I got done, the ACLU lady, a uh, woman I mean, she got up and she said, folks, this is an obviously an anti-evolution bill. One of the representatives said, uh, ma'am, evolution is not mentioned in this bill. All this bill says is we're not going to buy books if they have lies in them, and these things are lies, so we're not going to buy that book. How can you say this is an anti-evolution bill? And she said, everything mentioned in this bill is used to support the evolution theory. And the guy said, well, ma'am, is it true that these things mentioned here are, are, are false? She said, well, yes, but obviously this is an anti-evolution bill. She knew full well. If you, if you took all the lies out of the textbooks, there would be nothing left to support the evolution theory. I was in a debate one time at University of West Florida, and the uh, professor got up and he said, now, Mr. Hoven, you're claiming all these things are lies, and you're right, you're, all these things have been proven wrong, but, he said, I got a question for you. You told us we got to take all this stuff out of the book. What are you going to replace it with? <laughs> I said, uh, folks, what he's trying to not say is, uh, we want the kids to believe in evolution. We have to give them some evidence, and all we have are these lies, and you want to take these out of the book, so you better find some more evidence for my theory. I said, sir, if you don't have any evidence for your theory, I'm sorry. Maybe you ought to consider getting a new theory. I could suggest one for you, if you'd like. He did not like. <laughs> he don't want to hear about it, okay? All they have to support their theory are things that have been proven wrong many, many years ago. Here's some of the lies we covered in the first how many hours of this seminar so far. I'll just review them very, very quickly. The Colorado River was not formed slowly. Well, the Grand Canyon did not slowly form by the Colorado River running through it. Okay? The geologic column does not portray Earth's history. It does not even exist anywhere in the world. Rocks do not date the fossils. The fossils do not date the rocks. It is based on circular reasoning. We cover that on videotape number four. There are no index fossils. There's no such thing as an index fossil. The layers are not different ages. Petrified trees connecting them all prove the layers all formed at the same time. We cover that on video number four. Plants and animals are not related to each other. They have the same designer, but not the same uncle and grandpa. Change in species is not the real meaning of the word evolution. That's not really what they mean. There's a whole lot more to that. We covered that on video four. Natural selection does not cause any evolution. Natural selection selects. It doesn't create a thing. We believe in natural selection. The peppered moth story never happened. It's a lie. Comparative anatomy does not prove common ancestry. We covered that on videotape number four. Humans never have any gill slits. It's a human at conception. It's not a fish or an amphibian or anything else. And abortion is murder, plain and simple. Okay? The appendix is not vestigial. You do need your appendix. The whale does not have a vestigial pelvis. That is a lie. The human tailbone is not vestigial. If you think it is, I'll pay to have yours removed. <laughs> Dinosaurs did not live millions of years ago. Man did not evolve from animals or cavemen. The Big Bang is a big dud. It didn't happen. The horse series in your textbooks is a lie, proven wrong 50 years ago. Life cannot evolve from non-living matter, like the textbook says. The law does not ban teaching creation science, like some people want you to think. It's perfectly fine to teach creation science in the public schools. We'll get into more of that later. Smaller is not simpler. A little paramecium is more complex than a space shuttle. Smaller is not simpler. Smaller is more complex. But birds did not come from dinosaurs. Talk about a dumb idea. The eye did not arise by slow changes over billions of years. The first bird did not hatch from a reptile egg like Goulschmidt said. The trees of life in the textbooks are pure imagination. They didn't happen, folks. They drew it on paper, and that's as far as it goes. It didn't happen in reality. 
DNA does not prove evolution, it proves creation, it proves a designer. Fossils do not provide any evidence for evolution. Fossils don't count at all. You find a bone in the dirt, you can't prove that bone had any kids, <laughs> let alone kids that lived, and certainly not kids that were different than the grandparents. Fossils simply are a dead end street. They don't count for evolution. The earth was never, is, the earth is not billions of years old, and the earth was never a hot molten mass. The Pangea theory that's taught in your books never existed. They say all the continents used to fit together. I get that all the time. Oh, do you think all the continents used to fit together? I used to touch each other? I said, well, they still are. It's just the low places are full of water. I mean, the continents are still connected, you know. <laughs> what do you mean, did they? Hello. They still are. <laughs> Animals and plants are designed, not adapted to their environments. There are no simple living organisms. Life did not arise three and a half billion years ago like the textbook says. The sun did not form before the earth like the textbook says. Scientists have not made life in the laboratory. Snakes do not have vestigial legs. The earth never had an oxygen-free atmosphere like the textbook says. No animal is related to any other kind of animal. DNA is more than just chemicals, it carries information. Mutations do not improve the species. Similar bone structure does not prove a common ancestor, it proves a common designer. Amino acids do not prove relationships. Humans are not related to chimps. Darwin did not prove evolution. Textbooks do not teach kids to think critically. They teach them to not think at all. Arranging animals on paper does not prove a thing. Archaeopteryx is not part reptile. It's 100% bird. Feathers do not evolve from scales. It's not just the religious fundamentalists who disbelieve in evolution. Most folks disbelieve in evolution. Evolution is not a light which illuminates all facts. There is no evidence for the magnetic reversals at the ocean floor. The Constitution does not discuss separation of church and state. It does not discuss that. The Supreme Court did not ban creation. Let's give a little bit of the history of what really happened. In the 1800s, almost all the textbooks were thoroughly packed with information about creation, Christianity, godly teaching, kids memorized Bible verses. I remember in public school in Illinois growing up, we memorized Bible verses and said prayer every morning. Didn't hurt the kids a bit. Helped them quite a bit. Back then, kids got in trouble for their own spit wads. Today, it's for bringing guns and shooting people. It's a different world, and some of you older folks know what I'm talking about. It has changed radically. In 1925, Tennessee passed a law that said you cannot teach creation, you cannot teach evolution. It actually banned the teaching of evolution in the public schools. It's called the Butler Act. The ACLU, which is the American Communist Lawyers Union, decided they wanted to test this law. So they ran an ad in the paper said, we're looking for a teacher willing to claim that he taught evolution so we can have a trial to try to get this law overthrown. A guy named John T. Scopes volunteered. He said, I don't know if I taught evolution or not, but I did sub for a biology class one day, and I think all we had was a study hall, but if you want me to go testify that I taught evolution, I'll do it. So John Scopes went on the trial, lasted 10 days in the hot July Tennessee summer. After 10 days, John Scopes was found guilty of breaking the law. The law said, you can't teach evolution. He claimed he did, so he's found guilty. He, did, he admitted he did. He was fined a hundred bucks. Case was over. Later the fine was overturned on a technicality, but the judgment was not overturned. The evolutionist lost the Scopes Monkey Trial. If you want to read the entire story about what really happened, you can see it right here in this book, The Scopes Monkey Trial, the Tennessee, the world's most famous court trial. And by the way, if there's a movie circulating around your school called Inherit the Wind, you better be real careful about that. That's a dangerous movie. That takes, it does everything they can. It twists everything about the trial to make the Christians look dumb. You want to read word for word every word that was spoken there? Here it is right here, the court transcript verbatim. You can get it from Bryan College in Dayton, Tennessee. The Dayton Courthouse is still there with a big uh, museum where you can go out through and see where it actually happened. If you go north of Chattanooga, about, I don't know, 70 or 80 miles, you can get to Dayton, Tennessee. Been through there a bunch of times. There's a good uh, video expose, I mean a good book uh, expose about the Inherit the Wind movie that circulates around it. Just about every year this is shown in public schools here in Pensacola where they try to teach the kids the Christians were dumb and they lost the trial. They changed all sorts of things about that. And you ought to be up in arms over that being shown to your kids. You can sign a statement saying, I don't want my child shown the movie Inherit the Wind. Have it notarized and take it into the school. They won't show your kid. You say, it's against my religious convictions to lie to my kids, and that movie's a lie, okay? But I guarantee it'll be shown this year and next year and the next year. I saw it about four times growing up before I realized what a lie it was. You want to get the material from uh, Bryan College, there's their phone number, or from George Serrell, who has an excellent article about the Inherit the Wind, what really happened in the book, 
the real trial compared to the uh, Inherit the Wind movie, which is just baloney. Or you might want to get the book Ride to Glory. You can get it through our ministry. I don't read novels much, but this one is incredible. This guy said, what if the Scopes trial was redone this, this now, in the you know, 21st century, at a modern university? Whew. Brother, I couldn't put it down. I mean, I read a lot of books, but this one, I never should have started it, man. I, I, I couldn't. I didn't sleep for four days trying to finish that. <laughs> I wasn't quite that bad. But, um, in 1968, the last law banning evolution was overturned. Now keep in mind, there were many laws against teaching evolution until 1968. There's never been a law against teaching creation. The laws banned evolution. In 1980, the state of Arkansas passed a law and said, we want balanced treatment. If the teacher teaches evolution, they must also teach creation. You know, give it balanced treatment. The court in Arkansas, Eighth Circuit Court, I believe, struck that down and said, no, nope, this law is unconstitutional. They didn't say you couldn't teach creation. They just said you can't demand equal time. And the atheists started going around saying, see, you can't teach creation. <laughs> That's not what the law said. It's not what the court said. They never said you can't teach creation. They just said you can't require that the teachers teach creation. If we passed a law in Florida that said the teachers are required to breathe, I bet that law would be struck down because, I mean, I mean, you probably ought to breathe, but they can't require that you breathe, right? And that's what happened with the Arkansas law. Then Louisiana passed a law requiring um, teachers to teach creation if they taught evolution. Again, balanced treatment. Supreme Court struck this one. It went all the way to Supreme Court. Supreme Court struck it down. After the 1987 ruling by the Supreme Court, Stephen Jay Gould, who hated creationists, and had a set of my tapes on his uh, shelf. I went up and visited his office. His secretary was there. She said, yeah, he's got your tapes right here, Mr. Hovind. I never did get to meet him. He died a few years ago. He knows better now. He's no longer an evolutionist. But uh, <laughs> Stephen Gould said after the verdict, he said, no statute exists in any state to bar instruction in creation science. It could be taught before and it can be taught now. They never said you can't teach creation. The court said you can't require it. That's all. And don't let anybody tell you different. That's what the law, that's where it stands right now. Uh, Michael Zimmerman said, and he's, about, he's an evolutionist, he said, the Supreme Court ruling did not in any way outlaw the teaching of creation science in public schools. Quite simply, it ruled that in the form taken by the Louisiana law, it's unconstitutional to demand equal time for this subject. Creation science can still be brought into science classrooms if and when teachers and administrators feel it is appropriate. Numerous surveys have shown that teachers and administrators favor just this route. And in fact, creation science is being taught in science courses throughout the country. Eugenia Scott is the president of the National uh, Center for Science Education. Boy, what a lousy name. They're not, they're not in favor of science. They're in favor of defending evolution is all. She said, the Supreme Court decision says only that the Louisiana law violates the constitutional separation of church and state. It does not say that no one can teach scientific creationism, and unfortunately, many individual teachers do. Some school districts even require equal time for creation and evolution. Here's the web page, the head of the front home page on the National Center for Science Education. Welcome to the home page of NCSE, a nonprofit, tax exempt membership organization working to defend the teaching of evolution against sectarian attack. We are a nationally recognized clearinghouse for information and advice to keep evolution in the science classroom and scientific creationism out. That's why they exist. I spoke in Berkeley last November, Berkeley, California, that's where these guys are located. I went and visited the National Center for Science Education. <coughs> it's a little bitty storefront building. They had, I think, four or five employees all crammed in this little building. I thought, this is the National Center for Science Education. <laughs> oh, yeah, but property's expensive in Berkeley, I understand, you know, good place for them. I went in there, they didn't know who I was. I didn't tell them my name. I went in there, well, hey, what kind of information do you guys hear? I'm, I used to be a science teacher. And they began giving me pamphlets and articles and stuff, you know, from the Finally, one of the guys said, your voice sounds familiar. What's your name? I said, Kent Hovind. He said, I thought so. They taped a piece of paper on the floor that says Kent Hovind stood here. And I understand they won't walk on it. They walk around it. <laughs> <laughs> one of the guys came to all 10 hours that I lectured at Berkeley and asked me question after question after question. Look, these folks are not the enemy. Now, they do work for him, but they're not the enemy, okay? Satan is the enemy. They're just blinded, that's all. They're willingly ignorant, like the Bible says. But even the National Center for Science Education knows it's okay to teach creation if you want. William Provine said, teachers and school boards in public schools are already free under the Constitution of the United States 
to teach about supernatural origins if they wish in their science classes. Laws can be passed in most countries of the world requiring discussion of supernatural origins in science classes and still satisfy national legal requirements. And I have a suggestion for evolutionists. Include discussions of supernatural origins in your classes and promote discussion of them in public and other schools. Come off your high horse about having only evolution taught in science classes. The exclusionism you promote is painfully self-serving and smacks of elitism. Why are you afraid of confronting the supernatural creationism believed by the majority of persons in the U.S. and perhaps the worldwide? Good question. Why are they so afraid of this topic? I speak in public schools all the time. They, I'm telling you, some schools, though I can't get into, they are just absolutely afraid of having a creationist come in. There's no reason to fear. The fact is, most folks don't believe in evolution anyway. The fact is, there's no law saying you can't teach creation. Just go ahead. You don't, now, it is against the law for the public school teacher to use tax dollars to try to convert the kids to be a Buddhist or Catholic or Baptist or something else. That is against the law. But it's not against the law to discuss creation. Provine said, shouldn't students be encouraged to express their beliefs about origins in a class discussing origins? If you're discussing origins, then uh, let's discuss origins. But see, in the mind of the evolutionist, your answer must be naturalistic. Suppose I said, I want you to explain how computers came to be, but you cannot use man as your answer. I want a naturalistic explanation of how computers came to be. Well, you're dead in the water right up front because of the definitions I gave. And the evolutionist says, we have to explain how the world got here, but we can't use supernatural as an explanation. Well, <laughs> a duh. <laughs> And what we got here is like two computers arguing with each other, does man exist? They can't see him, they can't touch him, they can't feel him, <laughs> but he does exist. See, it's obvious the Creator would be outside of the creation. He's above and beyond. He's not affected by what He created. God created time, space, and matter. He's outside of time, space, and matter. The God's not affected by time. This is not 2003 in heaven. There's no time. And after we get to heaven, one of the first things you're going to do is flip your watch off and fling it over the side. You won't need that. There's no time there. We sing all these songs, you know, when we've been there 10,000 years. That's baloney. It's a good song. I like it. But we're not going to be there 10,000 years. We're just going to be there. Now, my brain can't handle that thought, but, you know, I can think about thinking about it. This public school teacher said, I'm a public school teacher, Mr. Hovind. I went to a conference today and we were all given a new science textbook to use in the conference. It's called Sciences by Trifle and Hazen and Wiley, John Wiley and Sons. On page 611, it said this, To what extent do you think that parents should have the right to decide which scientific theories and ideas are presented in schools? To what extent do you think parents ought to have the right to demand that opposing religious views be taught as well? Should the views of creationism, which are primarily based on one particular type of Christianity, be given special consideration? It's getting more difficult to say the truth all the time. The teachers now are being trained in sessions to how to handle creationists. I know this, they work very hard to make you feel like you are the only one complaining. When I went to meet the lady in charge of the science curriculum here in Pensacola, Florida, when I first moved to town, I've been complaining about some of the lies in the textbooks and the science curriculum, and she said to me, Mr. Hovind, you are the only person in the county complaining about this. I thought, there's, what, 128 Baptist churches in this town, plus all the other flavors? I mean, where, what's everybody doing? Aren't we supposed to be the salt of the earth? Man, salt irritates. Go irritate somebody. <laughs> That's our job. <laughs> Teachers can teach creation science in the classroom if they want. There's never been a law against it. Not only can you teach science, creation science in the public schools, you can teach it right out of the Bible. There's no law against reading your Bible in public school or bringing your Bible to public school. Or you can teach or devote a class to religion, and you can have a text, the textbook be the Bible. We know the effects what happened in 63 when the Bible was taken out and evolution was put in the schools, but we got deceived by the ACLU. In 1963, the Supreme Court banned the use of the Bible to get kids saved, which is not good, obviously, but it's a lot better than what the ACLU led us to believe. They did not throw the Bible out. We have thrown the Bible out because we have allowed ourselves to be deceived by the ACLU. You might want to get the website uh, bibleinschools.net and get the information by Elizabeth Rittenauer. She helps, helps people start Bible classes in their public school. Preacher, how'd you like to go every day and teach a Bible class to the public school kids at Tate or at Scambia High? Wouldn't it be awesome? You can do it. She, can, she knows how to cut through all the red tape and get it done. 
ACLU. Well, we could talk a long time about that. Call uh, BibleInSchools.net, get a hold of Elizabeth, or get the book from us, Teaching Creation Science in Public Schools. And, you know, it's certainly fine to do that, and many schools do. States can require teachers to discuss evolution. They can do that. But they set the state standards. The state school board or the legislature will rule and say, this is what we want the kids to know by third grade or by fifth grade or by seventh grade. They have state standards. And they sometimes include evolution. You, the kid must know about evolution by eighth grade. Now the problem is, the atheists are really good at packing that committee. That way you only have to have five or six atheists in the whole state and you can control what all the kids are learning. And then the Christians wait till the books are chosen to meet the standards and get in the classroom and then we complain about the books in the classroom. You're about three years too late. State standards are going to be selected for Florida textbooks in the next two months. This is the time. It'll affect the books that they buy in 94, September 94. Now is the time to do something. The states cannot require them to discuss creation. It's already been tried many times. And I've seen so many people waste enormous time and money on an effort trying to force creation into the schools. I'm telling you, you're wasting your time. It's not going to happen. And the atheists love it when a campaign gets started and say, we're going to make the schools teach creation. They love that. They just let you spend all your money and waste all your time and then defeat you in the last five seconds. They're not going to go anywhere. The teachers may discuss creation if they like in their class. They've always been allowed to do that. You might want to get a hold of the website textbookreviews.org, Mel Gabler. They've for 40 some years have been doing research on public school textbooks and what's being taught. Mel said, the courts allow states to require discussing scientific weaknesses in evolution theory, but not requiring discussing evidence for creation. You can't make the teacher talk about creation, but you can require them to talk about the weaknesses in the evolution theory. That's a start. In the landmark decision back in uh, 1963, the court held, it certainly may be said that the Bible is worthy of study for its literary and historic qualities. Nothing we have said here indicates that such study of the Bible or religion when presented objectively as part of a secular program of education, may be affected consistently with the First Amendment. Supreme Court said, the Bible may constitutionally be used in an appropriate study of history, civilization, ethics, comparative religion, or the like. Eighth Circuit Court ruled and said, permitting public school observances which include religious elements promotes the secular cause of advancing the student's knowledge and appreciation of the role our religious heritage played in the social, cultural, and historical development of civilization. Teachers already possess the flexibility to present a variety of scientific theories about the origins of mankind and are free to teach any and all facets of this subject, 1987 Supreme Court. The court further ruled, teaching a variety of scientific theories about the origins of mankind to school children might be done with a clear secular intent of enhancing the effectiveness of science instruction. California State School Board said, discussions of any scientific fact, hypothesis, or theory related to the origins of the universe, the earth, and of life, the how, are appropriate to the science curriculum. They're telling their teachers, if you want to talk about creation, do it. Can't be more clear than that. If you want to keep up on the latest of what's happening in education, you might want to watch the video, Crisis in the Classroom, from Eagle Forum, Phyllis Schlafly's organization. Now, I would disagree with Phyllis on several philosophical things, but I think she's got a great, done a great job with this video here on what's happening. So what do people say, what about the separation of church and state? Doesn't the Constitution say that? There's no such phrase mentioned in the Constitution. That phrase is found mentioned in a letter that Thomas Jefferson wrote to the Baptist Association in Danbury, Connecticut. The Constitution does not talk about separation of church and state. That's a lie. De Jefferson said, the First Amendment has erected a wall of separation between church and state. That's from his letter, not from the Constitution. By the way, this wall is a one-dimensional wall. It keeps the government from running the church, but makes sure the church Christian principles will always stay in government. Go see David Barton's excellent website, wallbuilders.com. You want to get more on how the, all the founding fathers believed the church had to influence government or up, government would go corrupt. Well, it's happened. What's happened over the years, several different people have taken upon themselves to survey the textbooks and see how much evolution is in this book. These guys did a survey of all the biology books used in 1991 and they found out the one used by Merrill called Biology and Everyday Experience only had 2.9% of the text devoted to evolution. It really wasn't talked about much. However, HBJ had 15.6%. They really crammed evolution down the throat of those kids. I've seen books today that have nearly 30%. Well, if I was on the committee to select textbooks this year, I would pick the least poisonous book I could find. 
And then I would write to the publishers of the other ones and say, hey folks, we did not pick your book this year because, and spell out your reasons. And then I would write to the one I did pick and say, hey fellas, we did pick your book this year because you got the least amount of evolution. However, we, need, we would like that out also. And we want to warn you, if we find another one next time that has less, we're going to buy them. You see, folks, there's only one language these textbook publishers speak. The only language they speak is money. Now, if you were the CEO at HBJ, Harcourt Brace Jovanovich, and you got letters from all over the country from people saying, hey, we did not buy your book this year because guess what you're going to do next year? Only language they speak, brother. If you want to get an excellent book on some of the lies in the textbooks to see what you ought to be watching for, get this one here by uh, Jonathan Wells, excellent book on icons of evolution. Or you may want to get the book by the Gablers. They've spent 40 years discussing lies in the textbooks and what you can do about it. Excellent ministry in Longview, Texas. Go to uh, textbookreviews.org or to uh, crsc.org. They've got a newer review of the more modern textbooks. Mel wrote me a letter, said, Dr. Hovind, thank you for using our book. What are they teaching our children? You'll be interested to know that in the 39 years of work, we've never seen publishers so sensitive or schools so receptive to our textbook reviews and ranking. We're pleased to recommend Harcourt Scott Forsman Elementary Science. They are much less dogmatic on evolution than the others we reviewed. Mel says the publishers are scared to death of their letters of recommendation because they know there's the sales of those that aren't recommended plummet in the states. But here's what happens. They only work in Texas. Texas is one of the largest publishers of text, or largest buyers of textbooks in the nation. So the publishers will publish all these books, you know, spend billions of dollars, millions of dollars publishing these books. They try to sell them. If Texas doesn't buy them, you think they're going to burn them? No, they're going to go peddle them off in some other state that's not looking. The Gablers have a crew of folks, they'll help, find, they'll help find errors in the textbooks. Like a book might say, you know, George Washington was Abraham Lincoln's vice president or something like that, you know. Dumb stuff. And they're not about to throw that book away. I mean, they spent a lot of money printing that thing. Nice, beautiful paper, you know, colored pictures. They're going to find some state that's not looking. So if you're in some state other than Texas, you better really be on the lookout. Get a hold of the Gablers and they'll tell you which ones to watch for. And they work on a donation basis and don't be a tightwad with them. Send them 50 bucks and say, here, send me your letters of recommendation. Adolf Hitler said, let me control the textbooks, I'll control the state. What's in these books anyway? And hey, what can I do to fix this problem? Well, this chart shows how the atheists have rated the different states in America and how well they teach evolution. They think here in Florida, we're doing a lousy job of teaching evolution. Yay. They think, they, they, they think the folks in Minnesota, where I was yesterday morning, are doing a wonderful job teaching evolution. You ought to be ashamed of yourself in Minnesota. Get that junk out of your textbooks, okay? You can get creation materials and put them in your library. Bert Wagner, up in Ohio, Iowa, knows how to cut through all the red tape and get this done. Get a hold of Bert and say, well, how do I get public schools to accept creation books? One guy wrote me a letter and said, Dr. Hoven, your video series was bought for our local high school, Waverly High, in Ohio. When I went to check out video number five, I found someone had hidden the box of seminars and date debates unopened and underneath a desk by a back wall. I was told by the librarian that she was told not to put them out for the students to find. My 18-year-old daughter witnessed this. We were very upset, but I was told it was proof that the enemy was trying to void and hide the truth. My daughter has since graduated and don't know if those tapes are available to students or not. So if you do do donate something, be sure to check and make sure it is, you know, kept on the shelf. I went to a bit one big university one time and I spent probably an hour going through their computer search system looking for how many books they had on evolution. It was like 18 or 1900 books about evolution. And then I searched for, to see how many books they had about creation. This is a big university library. Not one book. I searched every author that I know and I know most of them. I went to the librarian and I said, uh, I noticed you got 1800 books on evolution but you don't have any books on creation. Why is that? She said, there is too a good book in here on, on creation. She said, I put it in here myself. It's from my church, the Watchtower Society. <laughs> oh, brother, we got one Jehovah's Witness book in here <laughs> and 1800 teaching evolution. And then they brag about being a liberal university and giving the kids a liberal education. You're lying. A liberal education is when you look at all sides. Let's just discuss all sides and then decide where the truth lies. They don't want to compare evolution with creation because evolution looks stupid next to the truth. 
there's some practical things we can do, folks, to fix this. Number one, you can demand that the schools cut out the pages with false information. You don't have to get creation in the schools and you don't have to get evolution out. Just simply get the lies out. You can tell them you want them to glue the pages together or you can at least put a warning sticker in the front cover saying, kids, the information on page 97 is not correct. Or, you know, list the pages. I volunteered many times and I'll do it again. I will, if you will send me your textbook, I will check the pages that need to be torn out. I'll make a tape recording while I'm traveling someplace and I'll hand you the tape and it'll say, you know, the information on page 84 is wrong, tear that page out, and you know, page 217 is wrong, and I'll list the pages. And if you, got, if you tore the pages out of the book, it won't cost the school one penny. I'll show you. So simple. Because the first objection they're going to say is, oh, this would cost the schools a lot of money. It won't cost them a penny. How many of you would volunteer to tear the pages out of the books and bring your own scissors? Let me see. There you go. So when you go to your school board, hand them a list of 500 names and say, these people are willing, to, when would you like it done? Won't cost a thing. Look, the book is not sacred, it's made out of paper, you know. If you, if you bought it, the county bought it, it belongs to the school. If you want to tear a page out, that's perfectly fine. I was in a debate with a professor at university, I was just speaking at UWF here oh, a year or so ago, and I mentioned tear the page out of the book, and this one professor said, I don't think we should deface textbooks. I said, well, sir, if you were teaching math, and you came across the book that said, you know, 2 plus 2 is 5, what would you do? He said, I would tell the students to mark out the wrong answer and write in the right answer. I said, oh, you would deface a textbook? I said, now, sir, if you were teaching biology and you found a book that said the embryo has gills, and you know that's proven wrong in 1874, what are you going to do? He said, well, nothing. I said, you wouldn't correct it? He said, no. I said, well, then you, sir, are a hypocrite. And you got no business using tax dollars to lie to these kids. You ought to get a different job changing tires or picking peaches and work for a living for a change. Guys like that burn me up, brother. <laughs> like a leech, you know, sucking on somebody else's blood that they built, you know. Number four, you can give the kids my little brainwashed book. There are different people around the country that buy these by the thousand and give them out to people in their schools. One guy from Santa Rosa County bought 3,000 of these books several years ago, gave them to all the kids in the county. They're going to have a hard time teaching evolution for a while over there. Buy some books or go to your school board and say, would you please vote to purchase this book to go along with our biology book so the kids can see the lies in their books. If the school board buys them, great. If you get them, you know, more than 10, you get them for a dollar a piece. If the school board says, no, we don't want those books in school, then you run a full page ad in your paper, stop by the following address and pick up the book the school board banned. Now the kids will get it and read it. Mm-hmm, yeah. Florida has a law. They've changed the number now. It used to be 233.09E, uh, I believe, but they changed it so people couldn't find it, I guess. It's now statu Florida Statute 1006.35, Accuracy of Instructional Materials. You know, Florida, state of Florida legislature, can vote to recall books if they're, if they're not accurate. They can, they can write letters to the publishers and demand that they change the books. The laws on the books, folks, the, there's the, the textbooks are supposed to be accurate, but they're not. They contain 50-some lies in every textbook I've seen. Get the pages out. Texas has a law requiring textbooks to be accurate. Wisconsin has a law requiring textbooks to be accurate. Alabama has a law that says textbooks shall be adequate and current. Well, if they're still teaching the baby has gill slits, they're not current. They're 128 years behind the times. Alabama had, used to have a sticker, they modified it now, watered it down some, but the sticker used to say, this textbook discusses evolution, a controversial theory. And students need to be, learn there's a difference between microevolution, which is a fact, and macroevolution, which is not a fact. Go Bama. California has a requirement, textbooks shall be factually accurate. Many states have this requirement, but they're just simply not enforcing it. Did you know the publishers will publish a special book just for our state? If the committee got together and said, look, well, Glencoe, we like your book, however, we want you to take out chapter 3 or take out the following pages. Do you know how much money is spent just in one school district on textbooks? A publisher would be foolish not to, you know, to turn down a contract for three quarters of a million dollars. They'll publish a special book. They do it all the time for different states. Get on that committee and do something about it. You can also, parents, be aware that your kids 
can be exempted from anything you don't want them taught. If you don't want your kids taught evolution, you sign a little paper that says, I do not want my student taught evolution. It's against my religious convictions. Have it notarized, sign, and give it to the school principal, the teacher, superintendent. And if they do teach your kid evolution, or if they say, oh, you've got to stay in class, then you can simply say, do you discriminate against people because of their religion? Ooh, that'll get their attention. Now, here are some pitfalls you've got to watch for in your school. I've seen this so many times. If the school is going to have a good program, some left-wing liberal will make sure that it's an opt-in program. In other words, you have to get parents' permission to go to the program. This happens all the time when I speak in schools. The kids have to come back with a note and saying, it's okay for me to go to Hovind's program. But if you're going to have some homosexual speak in your school, or some lesbian about the gay lifestyle, which is not gay at all, and it's not a lifestyle, it's a death style, if they're going to speak in your school, they'll make sure it's an opt-out program. You see the difference? In other words, you have to get a note in order to not come. But if it's a good program, you've got to get the note to go. And if it's a bad program, you've got to get a note to not go. They don't want a level playing field, folks. And if you have a superintendent or a school principal that tries that one, you ought to help him get a different job, too. Put the pressure on. You just need to find a new job, maybe in a new county someplace. Some practical steps you can do. Number one, kids, don't confront your teachers publicly. Try to talk to them after class. Now listen carefully. If you are late to class frequently, if you're a troublemaker or a goof-off, if you never do your homework, if you don't pay attention in class, then please don't tell them you're a Christian. <laughs> Shut your mouth. <laughs> First, be a good student. Now, if a question comes up on the test that says, you know, how old is the earth? And you know the answer they want. You can simply write on the test, the textbook says 4.6 billion. However, this is not correct. Now they know you learned the book, you did your homework, but you don't believe it, you didn't swallow it. That's perfectly fine. Number two, you can ask to be exempt. Now parents have to do this, the kids can't do it. I, I'm not positive of that statement, but I believe it has to be done by the parents. You have to say, I want my child exempt from anything that's against our religion. Sign a note, give it to the school. Look, if 40 or 50 or 60 percent of the class was standing out in the hallway, wouldn't take the teacher long to figure out, you know, we ought to just skip that chapter. I had one guy call me up one day, he said, Brother Hovind, my second grade daughter has watched your videotapes probably 50 times. She can quote them. I don't know why kids watch the same tape over and over and over and over. He said, my second grade daughter's teacher just called me. And she said, sir, every time I talk about something in the class having to do with evolution, your, your daughter stops me and says, ah, oh, teacher, don't, that's not right. And the teacher said, I just want you to know, I'm going to skip evolution for the rest of the time this girl's in my class. My first thought was, yay, this is great. And then I thought, why are we sending second graders off to war? Why aren't the parents fighting this battle? You know, the second grader ought to be able to go to class and read the book and believe what they're taught. Why are we allowing lies in the textbooks? Why are we, laying, why are we allowing liars in the te in the, to teach? <laughs> Don't lie to the kids. You can contact Joe Baker. He helps folks set up meetings on... Uh, getting kids in their school fired up on to do something in their local school. Joe had me come speak at his high school in Pennsylvania. They had an auditorium, seats about 1,000 people. They had 1,500 people come. The, fire, the pr principal was pulling his hair out, nervous as a cat, thinking the fire marshal's going to come you know, arrest me and throw me in jail. You know? They turned away like 300 people at the door said, no, you can't get in. And I spoke for over two hours at that public high school in Pennsylvania. Joe Baker arranged the whole thing, and he's been on fire for God ever since. Get a hold of him and say, what can I do in my school? If you're a public school student and you want to do something, Joe can help you get going. Um, some practical steps. You can give your teachers a video to watch at home. You can pray for them. <coughs> Teaching is a tough job. My brother's in his 34th year. He said, Kent, it's not fun anymore. I can't wait to quit teaching. I'm, about, I'm sick of this. Teaching public school up in Illinois. My mom retired from teaching public school. You can invite your teachers to a creation seminar. You can have them call me with any questions. You can ask my secretary, Martha, sitting right there. I take questions all day long and half the night. <laughs> I'll be glad to help. You can ask them to have a creation speaker speak in your public school. I've got a list of about eight pages of names of other people that speak on creation. We'll be glad to get somebody to you as quick as we can. You, some of you could run for school board. You could influence the textbook selection committee. You could pass or then enforce the laws requiring books to be accurate. The Bible says the fear of man bringeth a snare. And we got a bunch of Christians that are scared to do anything for fear somebody might not like them. A uh, duh, <laughs> we're supposed to be Christians, you know. They didn't like the disciples very well or Jesus himself, did they? Our job is to do what's right.
Leave the results up to him. Okay. You can try to convert the teachers or the students. You could write letters to the editor. That's what got my whole ministry started, brother. You and I were working together at the factory at M&A. Article came out of the newspaper that said, Dinosaur bones are found from 80 million years ago. And I wrote my first ever letter to the editor. I'd never written to the, letter, to the editor before. I said, these dinosaur bones were from the flood of Noah, 4,400 years ago. Well, man, you would have thought I shot the sacred cow. <laughs> For the next six or eight months here in Pensacola, I got called every name you can imagine in the paper. And I wrote letters back and forth, and they, other people wrote letters. And Finally, the university asked me to come do a debate, and a couple churches asked me to come speak, and now it's 14 years later, and I've got 30 people on my staff, and get, what, 20 calls a week, Martha, asking me to come? <laughs> 55? <laughs> it, it's, it's, it's crazy. There's a war going on. Get in. Amen. Find something to do. You can donate some creation books to your public library or public school library. We get calls and letters just about every week from somebody getting saved because they watched a book, watched a video or read a book that they checked out of their public library, one of our videos. Donate some. You could educate others to use creation as a means of evangelism. Here's what the ACLU will do, though. They will threaten a lawsuit if somebody tries to teach creation. Now, they know they would lose, but it doesn't matter. The fact that it's going to be a lawsuit is going to be costly for the school. So the ACLU, knowing they'll lose, threatens to sue, and sometimes even sues, knowing the school will back down for fear of not having enough money to defend themselves. They're winning by default. They claim teachers can only teach what is state in state-approved curriculum. Well, that's a lie. The curriculum really starts when the classroom door closes. Every teacher knows that. And every teacher discusses things in their class that are not in the textbook. <laughs> Come on, you can't teach otherwise. They claim teachers cannot correct the curriculum. That's a lie. They do it all the time. I taught math and science for years. I was always making corrections in the math book. And they mislead people into thinking that evolution is a sacred part of science that's never to be questioned. They use peer pressure or ridicule to silence those who oppose lies in the textbooks. Now, if you're going to do something, you be prepared for opposition from the enemy. Satan protects his evolution theory with a vengeance. This is the foundation for all sorts of things. Roger DeHart, science teacher at Burlington Edson High School in Seattle, was told he could not inform students of errors in the textbooks just simply by passing out current science journals. If there's a current science journal that said this is wrong, he couldn't tell his students because in the book it said it was right. Some of these lies have been proven wrong 100 years ago. Kevin Haley, biology teacher at Oregon Community College, lost his job simply for exposing errors in the textbooks. Baylor University, formerly Christian University, fired William Dembski just because he advocated intelligent design. He said there must be a designer. Forrest Mims was a science writer for 20 years. He published in National Geographic, Science Digest, American Journal of Physics, 60 magazines and newspapers. He was denied a job as science writer or writer for Scientific American simply because he was a creationist. Rod Levake in Fairbault, Minnesota. Uh, was reassigned because he doubted Darwin's theory. They said, we don't want you teaching evolution. We don't want you teaching biology if you doubt Darwin's theory. Dan Clark in Lafayette, Indiana, uh, he quit because he was reprimanded for teaching an evolution alternative. The superintendent, Mr. Ed Eller, told him not to introduce creationism to this class. Well, Mr. Ed Eller, you need to get a different job. We, our grass needs mowed once in a while. Come on down. We might put you to work if you're a hard worker. Okay? He said, I'm quitting. I'm not going to take this. There's all kinds of articles here. Dean Kenyon was a tenured professor in San Francisco at the university. He'd been teaching for years. He wrote books about evolution, how wonderful evolution was. He was the poster boy of the evolutionist. And then one day he got converted. And they fired him. But he said, hey, I got, I got 20 years. You can't fire me. Oh, okay. They put him in as a lab assistant, you know, washing test tubes. Had to go through a whole big lawsuit just to get his job back, simply because he doubted Darwin's theory. So don't think it's going to be an easy road. There's some things you can do. Cut the pages out. Get something done in your area. There's all kinds of practical steps. You can watch our video four for other stuff like that. All right. Why is this theory dangerous? It's dangerous because it's bad science backed up by lies. Number two, it brings forth bad fruit. All the effects of evolution that I know of are evil and wicked. We teach the kids they're an animal. We teach them there's no moral standard. There's no absolute. What do you expect? This theory has led directly to the rise of communism, humanism, Marxism, Nazism, socialism, and the coming New World Order. 
the dangers of this evolution theory. Folks, it's not just dumb, it's dangerous. You're going to be shocked and see how many, to see how many people have died because of this theory. Why did we fight the Vietnam War? Why did we fight World War II? Why was World War I fought? Why are we fighting against communism? How many people did Hitler kill? How many did Stalin kill? We'll cover all that tomorrow night. Well, let's continue now with what we talked about last night about the dangers of the evolution theory. We talked, uh, answered the question, or began answering the question, why is evolution a dangerous theory? We talked about the fact that it's bad science based on lies. Kids do not learn how to think when all they're taught is this evolution theory. It's like me asking somebody to explain how computers came to be, but you cannot use man as your answer. You have to give a naturalistic explanation. <laughs> well, you've already shut out the only logical answer. And the kids are in school are tr trying to learn how the universe came to be, but it can't be God. It's got to be something else. Well, you already shut out the only logical answer. So they're not learning how to think. It's a dangerous theory for science. It's a, it's a hindrance to the advancement of science, and it brings forth bad fruit. The Bible says an evil tree, every good tree which bringeth forth good fruit, but a corrupt tree bringeth forth evil fruit. A good tree cannot bring forth evil fruit, neither can a corrupt tree bring forth good fruit. Evolution is the foundation philosophy for humanism. The idea that man is God of the universe. The humanist philosophy is talked about in Romans chapter 1. It says they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, so God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient. You ought to read all of Romans chapter 1 and see the steady slide people go down once they reject God as the creator. This fellow said, do humanists believe in a supreme being? Emphatically, yes, that supreme being is man. Humanists have no knowledge of any being more supreme. Well, I would be glad to introduce them to one if they'd, be, if they'd lie. I know one. Amen. It's a whole lot more supreme. I mean, can you imagine? If the infinite God could fit in your little three-pound brain, he wouldn't be very big, and he sure wouldn't be worth worshiping. Man, the God that I worship is beyond comprehension. Amen. I mean, he tells us a lot about himself, but your brain just can't handle it. Neither can mine. So... This guy said, the turning point in history will be the moment that man becomes aware that the only God of man is man himself. Some of these guys think they are God. Boy, that was Hitler's philosophy. I'm God. I'm God. I'm God. I'm God. I'm God. I'm God. Hey, Gabriel, come and listen to this. Ha, 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 ha. We're not such big stuff, folks. <clears throat> George Wald, the Nobel Prize winner, said, I will not accept that, talking about creation, philosophically, because I do not want to believe in God. Therefore, I choose to believe in that which, is, I, know is, that which I know is scientifically impossible. Spontaneous generation arising to evolution. He said, I know it's not possible, but the only other alternative is God did it. And I don't want that, so I'll believe the impossible. Well, you're going to feel awful stupid for eternity no one, you missed the opportunity to live forever with the creator of the universe because you were willingly ignorant, just like 2 Peter says. This guy says, we no longer feel ourselves to be guests in someone else's home. He's talking about God. This is Rifkin, who's one of those tree huggers who writes all kinds of books about, you know, save the environment, kill all the people, but save the environment. Jeremy Rifkin said, we no longer feel ourselves to be guests in somebody else's home and therefore obliged to make our behavior conform to a set of pre-existing cosmic rules. It's our creation now. We make the rules. We establish the parameters of reality. We create the world, and because we do, we no longer feel beholden to outside forces. Talking about God, of course. He said, we no longer have to justify our behavior, for we are now the architects of the universe. We are responsible to nothing outside of ourselves. So we are the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Wow, is right. The Bible said in 2 Peter, in the last days, scoffers would come that would be willingly ignorant of how God made the heavens and the earth, and the earth was standing into the water and out of the water. We cover all that on video number two. The Bible says the scoffers are going to be walking after their own lust. You know, the only reason people reject God is because of their lust. There's no scientific reason to reject the Bible. There's no scientific reason to reject the creation account. There's no scientific reason to reject the idea that there's a creator. But some people just don't like the idea of God telling them what to do. The idea of God chaps their hide. Well, I tell them they better get some Vaseline, man. They're going to need it because we're going to be judged by the very God you don't believe in. This guy says, we take the side of science in spite of the patent absurdity of some of its constructs. 
In spite of its failure to fulfill many of its extravagant promises of health and life, in spite of the tolerance of the scientific community for uns unsubstantiated just-so stories, because we have a prior commitment, a commitment to materialism. He said, materialism is an absolute. We cannot allow a divine foot in the door. A professor that I had at, uh, in Illinois Central College in East Peoria, Illinois, wrote a really cool article years ago. It was two computers, computers arguing with each other, does man exist? <laughs> Showing the absurdity of two humans trying to argue, does God exist? The computers couldn't see, them, couldn't see man, so therefore he didn't exist. And they were going through all kinds of explanations of how, you know, they gradually got all this circuitry by ch blind chance. The same kind of dumb arguments the evolutionists do, trying to explain how life arose by chance. What happened? Satan put it into the heart of some of his followers that they should build a kingdom and rule the world. And they really have serious plans to build a world empire right here. And you and I do not fit in. Matter of fact, they're anxious to get rid of us, big time, okay? Secretly, secretly Satan plans to use his followers to destroy much of humanity. But then he's going to destroy them also. The communists have done that for years. They always get some revolutionaries to go in and take over a country. And the first thing the communists do when they take over, they kill the revolutionaries that, that killed everybody else because they can't trust them. And Satan, Satan is using some of his followers and they've got it in their head that they need to reduce the population of the planet. We cover all that on videotape number one or in our college course, CSE 101. We cover that in great detail, how that there are people who think we should reduce man's population here to one half billion. You can go to Elberton, Georgia and see the Georgia Guidestones where it says right on there, maintain humanity under a half billion. Right now there are six billion. They want to reduce the population by about 95%, according to Ted Turner. I said, well, go ahead, Ted, you first. <laughs> they just get off any time you want. Now, if evolution is true, then who owns the world? Who makes the rules? How do we determine right from wrong? I've asked people all over the place, how do you tell right from wrong if evolution is true? There simply is no possible way to tell right from wrong. It's a real simple question, but they have no answer. You can't tell right from wrong if evolution is true. Uh, if man is God, and this is what evolution means, then man makes the rules and the strongest survive. Might makes right. There's no way to tell right from wrong. I had a professor tell me one time, there are no absolutes. I said, are you absolutely <laughs> sure? <laughs> Blew his little brain. Now let me think for just a minute. How can I be absolutely? Yeah, of course they're absolutes. Kids today are wandering around in this world with no moral anchor because they don't know right from wrong. They really don't. There simply is no way to tell. Now folks, there's a war going on and you're going to have to decide which side you want to get on. You can't be neutral in this one. During the Civil War, this one fellow decided he did not want to get involved. By the way, it's not the Civil War, it's Abe Lincoln's War. Another long story. We cover that on CSE 103. Okay. The college class number three, uh, 103. During the Civil War, though, this guy decided he, did not, he didn't want to get involved. So he put on a Yankee jacket and rebel pants. He said, both sides will leave me alone now. Well, after the battle, he was found dead. His Yankee jacket full of rebel bullet holes and his rebel pants full of Yankee bullet holes. <laughs> Folks, there's a war going on. You might as well get on one side or the other. Just give it all you got. Give it to your general, okay? You just say, Lord, here I am reporting for duty. What would you like me to do? Here's the problem, as I understand it. There's a war going on between Satan and God. We are the battlefield. People are going to get hurt. People are going to get killed. You better just get on one side or the other. The decision is very simple. You just decide which side you want to be on and then do whatever your general says. If you want to serve the devil, you just go ahead. If you want to serve God, come on. It's wonderful. Henry Morris has a tremendous book on this topic, The Long War Against God. If you want to understand the history of the evolutionary conflict, this one is awesome. There's another one, I don't know if it's a close second or maybe a tie with this one, called In the Minds of Men by Ian Taylor. One of the best books I've ever read covering the, the whole history of this. Why do people think this way? And I encourage people to read good books. Now kids, you're going to be the same person you are 20 years from now as you are right now, except for the books you read and the people you meet. Shut off the TV once in a while and read some books. There are many good books that will influence you forever. Man, I've read books that just changed my life, brother. You, know, you come across some, it's like, wow, you're just a different person from then on. Now, the Christians have an incredible advantage in this war. Uh, I read the last chapter. We win. Amen. 
Now, between now and then, it's going to get pretty bad. We're going to cover some things tonight about the New World Order. It might be a little scary. Folks, you don't need to get nervous. I read lots of books about the New World Order. I think I have a fairly good grasp of what's going on. I read about the microchip and all kinds of things happening, you know, and I see the world events, and then I go to sleep. Because Psalm 2 is a great tranquilizer for that. We cover a whole lot more on the New World Order on our CSE Class 103 for the college, four different college courses that we offer. You can call our website for that. We're going to trace a little bit of the history of the conflict and then tell you what you can do about it. Things, practical things you can do for your general. God created the world, He owns it, and He makes the rules. The Bible says the earth is the Lord's. If you don't like it, then go make your own world. <laughs> but He owns this place. About 6,000 years ago, probably within the first few hundred years after the creation, Lucifer decided he wanted to be God. There's no possible way Lucifer fell, Lucifer fell from heaven before the creation. We cover all that on videotape number two about the gap theory and the day-age theory. Satan could not have fallen before the creation. So sometime after the creation, maybe 100 years, Lucifer decided he wanted to be God. So <clears throat> God created the world. Satan rebelled against God and tried to destroy his creation. That's the subject of this session. First of all, it appears that uh, Satan wants to do at least three things. He wants to make mankind wicked so God will have to destroy them. Satan made everybody wicked in the days of Noah and God had to kill them all, all but Noah and his family. So Satan works very hard to make people wicked just so that God will have to destroy his creation. That's one of Satan's goals. Number two, he wants to convince some men to destroy other men. You guys like Adolf Hitler thinking they ought to kill the Jews and guys like Paul Pot thinking they ought to kill the Cambodians. I mean, people think they ought to kill everybody. You got guys in the Taliban think they ought to kill anybody that won't convert to Islam. And by the way, the Koran clearly teaches if a person will not convert to Islam, they should be executed. We cover all that on video number seven. Now praise God for the people that are trying to reach the Muslims and they need the gospel like everybody else. But they're in the middle, they're absolutely brainwashed with the silly idea that if they're a good faithful member of the Islam, they get to go to heaven and get 72 wives. They never thought about the 72 mother-in-laws. <laughs> Or having to feed them 72 wives. <laughs> Talk about, it, it, it's, we could get off on a long rabbit trail. We're going to do a whole videotape someday just on the dangers of Islam and that teaching. Now, the people can be saved and make great Christians. And God loves them, but He hates what they believe. They've been duped. You ought to get the book that we sell in our bookstore called The Prophet. If you want to understand the history of the Muslim church and how it got started, it'll scare you when you realize what, who started it and why. Get into that some other time. Number three, well, Satan wants to keep as many people from hearing the gospel as possible. And that's where the evolution theory comes into the textbooks. The kids have an alternative explanation for how the world got here, so they never even consider looking for the real creator of the universe. Satan's used many different people and methods to accomplish his goals. He makes men think he is God, makes man think he is God, and makes the rule. Satan knew this would lead to genocide. Once people think they're in charge, well, then they decide they're going to rearrange the world today with the way they want it. So we're going to kill those that we don't want to be here. Ezekiel 28 tells about Lucifer. It says, Thou wast perfect in the day that thou wast created, till iniquity was found in thee. The heart was lifted up because of thy beauty. Thou hast corrupted thy wisdom by reason of thy brightness. God said, I will cast thee to the ground. I will lay thee before kings, that they may behold thee. How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut, cut down to the ground, which didst weaken the nations? You know, Satan is, this battle is really Satan versus God. It's not, you know, us versus them or cowboys versus Indians. It's Satan versus God. That's what it really boils down to. Satan, Isaiah tells us that Satan said, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars. I will sit upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most high. Yet thou shalt be brought down to hell, to the sides of the pit. They that see thee shall narrowly look upon thee and consider thee, saying, Is this the man? that made the earth to shake, the earth to tremble, and did shake the kingdoms, that made the world as a wilderness and destroyed the cities. You know, Judgment Day, we're going to stand before God, and we're going to see Satan getting ready to cast into hell. We're going to say, this is, the, this is it? That's it? How many saw the movie Wizard of Oz? Remember when they finally realized, it's a little old man behind the curtain pulling those levers. That's it? That's Oz? <laughs> That's the way we're going to feel when we see Satan. you got to be kidding. That's it? When I went to um, Massachusetts, first time to speak at a church up there, I went to see Plymouth Rock, you know, where the pilgrims landed, you know, and we walked up to this little pavilion and the preacher said, well, go ahead and say it. I said, say what? He said, say what everybody says when they see Plymouth Rock. I said, that's it? He said, yep, that's it. That's what everybody says. <laughs> that's what 
that's a rock about this big with a date on there, 1620, you know. That's it, yeah. We're going to look at Satan and say, that's the one that made the nations tremble? You've got to be kidding. And the people who are going to go to hell for eternity are going to feel awfully dumb realizing they got, they got deceived by such a simple process. They were so blinded. How many of you have ever been fooled and you felt just real stupid afterwards? You ever do that? <laughs> like a duh, how could I be fooled by that? That's the way folks that go to hell are going to feel. Like, wow, you got to be kidding. Satan is making his plans to rule the world, like Pinky in the Brain. <laughs> God's up in heaven laughing about it. Now look, when you get all nervous about the new world order, just read Psalms chapter 2. It's a great tranquilizer. Psalm 2 said, Why do the heathen rage and the people imagine a vain thing? The kings of the earth set themselves. The rulers take counsel together against the Lord, against His anointed, saying, Let us break their bands asunder and cast away their cords from us. He that sitteth in the heavens shall laugh. You know, they've got plans for a new world order. They really do. They have plans for an electronic currency where you can't buy anything without a chip in your hand or in your forehead. Plans are coming soon. There are plans to control the planet. They're, they want to control the food. They want to control the population. They want you to get a permit to cut your grass and cut down a tree on your property. they got plans to rule the world, folks, and it's serious. God's laughing about the whole thing. They're planning to build their kingdom. You've got to read the book of Daniel and see how this kingdom, how the, 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 tells, God tells the whole history right there. Nebuchadnezzar was the head of gold, you know, the nearly pure kingdom absolute authority, then the silver chest and arms, and then the belly and thighs of brass, and the legs of iron, the Roman Empire. You can read through all the book of Daniel and see the five kingdoms. Well, the last kingdom is where ten kingdoms try to get together, but it's partly iron, partly clay. It's going to be weak and it's going to crumble. And in those days, the Lord's going to cut a stone out of the mountain without hands, and it's going to smite the image on the feet. God's going to set up His kingdom. We'll talk more about that in a minute. started by Satan tricking Eve in the Garden of Eden. He said to the woman, Yea, hath God said, the first thing Satan always does is question God's Word. Then he said, Ye shall not surely die. That's an outright denial of God's Word. And then he said, Eve, if you eat off that tree, ye shall be as gods. That's the same technique he's always used. Make you doubt God's Word, then he denies God's Word, and then he says, See, you're going to be God. Wow, I get to be God. That's what humanism is all about. Satan's plan's always been the same. Make you doubt Deny God's Word and then deify mankind. Tell you, you can evolve. He tried the same thing with Jesus. He said, Jesus, if you fall down and worship me, all these things will I give you. Isn't that what he told him? I'll give you all this stuff if you just worship me. He's a liar. He doesn't own it to begin with. And Satan always promises people things if you'll follow me. He said, all these things will I give thee if thou wilt fall down and worship me. Jesus answered and said, it is written. That's all you got to do, folks. When the devil starts giving you a hard time, just start quoting Scripture to him. He can't stand that. But he knows the Scripture really well. He'll take half a verse here and there. See what he did all through Scripture. Okay? He'll take half a verse. You just got to watch what he's doing. So a satanic high priest, uh, Aleister Crowley, said that his demon told him the year 2000 would mark the end of the superstition of Christianity and the beginning of the Golden Age, when those possessing the will to dominate would conquer and would ascend to Godhood. Well, guess what, Mr. Crawley? You missed it. And you're not going to ascend to Godhood. You're going to descend to worm food. That's right. so what's going to happen. Satan wants you to think you can evolve into a god. Now, what you believe determines how you behave. That's always been the case throughout the world. The Bible says, Beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit, after the tradition of man and the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. Philosophy means the love of man's wisdom. Sophie means man's wisdom, where we get a word sophomore. Wisd soft means wise. More, where we get our word moron, means fool. A sophomore is a wise fool. That's the age where they usually think they know it all. <laughs> How many have been there before? You've seen those kind? Okay, yeah, sophomore. They pick the word very carefully for that age group. <laughs> soft means wise, man's wisdom, philosophy, filio, the love of. Maybe you've been to Philadelphia, the city of brotherly shove, or whatever they call it, okay? Uh, Evolution is nothing but a philosophy. It's not a science. It's a philosophy. It's a religion. What it does, it tries to make you think that we can take God out and put man in his place. There are some excellent books you ought to be reading if you want to get up on all the philosophy of man's wisdom. You can read uh, Seven Men Who Rule from the Grave. Oh, the philosophy of these seven guys who absolutely still, still govern the world today. People like Karl Marx, uh, Joseph Stalin, guys like that. Uh, you can read about the Fourth Reich of the Rich. 
how that some of the rich people in the world, I mean the super rich people, have plans to control the world. Yeah, big time serious plans. You want to get more on the Council of Foreign Relations and how they are involved. We, these are all books we sell in our bookstore. I have people that get, get after me, brother. Some, a couple of other, I think, good friends of mine that uh, they say, oh, you get off on too many rabbit trails. Doesn't tie into creation. Oh, I think freedom ties directly to creation. Our founding father said, we hold these truths to be self-evident. All men are created equal. They're endowed by their creator. So to me, the creation movement ties directly into things like gun control, stuff like that. I don't have a problem with it at all. You know, coming from some country where they don't have our American roots, I can understand where they don't see how it fits in, but I'm sorry, it does fit in. Dr. Henry Morris has this great book about the long war against God. Now, evolution is the foundation philosophy for racism. How can you think one person is superior to somebody else? Some people thought, well, if, those neuro if there is no God and we just evolved from apes, which are dark colored, maybe the uh, white-skinned people have evolved farther. By the way, racism's been around a long time, but boy, when Darwin's book came out, it's like throwing gas on a fire. Racism ex escalated incredibly after that. Evolution is the foundation philosophy for racism. Charles Darwin wrote a book. Here it is right here. It's called The Origin of Species. That's not the whole title to the book. They're kind of embarrassed by the whole title because it is very politically incorrect. I'll show it to you in a second. This book says, The Origin of Species. Now this book came out 1859. The evolution theory was around way before that. But Darwin simply made it popular. He gave them an excuse of how it happened. Now what is a species anyway? This textbook shows a bunch of different monkeys and says they're all different species. Okay, but they're the same kind of animal. They're still a monkey. And just because some guy decides that we've got, you know, 12 species of monkeys here, doesn't mean they're different kinds. They're still the same kind of animal. This textbook, used in Escambia for a while, shows the different, a uh, little more to the title. It says, Darwin's pub published his findings in a book titled, On the Origin of Species by Means of Natural Selection. That's still not the whole title. Here's the whole title to the book. You can look at it yourself. The Origin of Species by means of natural selection or the preservation of favored races in the struggle for life. Oh, favored races. Now, Charlie, that's not politically correct. Well, back in 1859 it was. 1859, we had slavery in this country, folks. Racism was very popular, even in the non-slave states. They didn't want them to be enslaved, but they still thought they were inferior in many cases. Darwin thought natives were just advanced animals. Darwin said in uh, the book Descent of Man, another book he wrote, he said, at some future period, not very distant as measured by centuries, the civilized races of man will almost certainly exterminate and replace the savage races throughout the world. Now, if a professor said that today, how long would he keep his job? By the way, you ought to go read the old newspapers, I mean like a hundred years ago, and see how they talked about the Indians as being savages. They always referred to them as savages, like they're inferior somehow. Darwin said in his book, Thus from the war of nature, from famine and death, the most exalted object we are capable of conceiving, the production of higher animals directly follows. See, Darwin's philosophy was messed up. He thought the more war, the more famine, the more death you have, the faster things evolve. The question is really very simple. Did man bring death into the world? Or did death bring man into the world? could not be more opposite. Darwin's philosophy says death brought man into the world. Now, you have to understand, in 1859, when this book came out, slavery was legal in many parts of the world. By the way, there's still slavery going on today in many parts of the world, okay? Negroes were bought and sold like cows. You owned them like property. You could do with them as you please. They had absolutely no rights. Now, Henry Fairfield Osborne, who was the curator at the American Museum of Natural History, said, the standard of intelligence of the average adult Negro is similar to that of the 11-year-old youth of the species Homo sapien. He's trying to get across the idea that Negroes are a different species, isn't he? Uh, that's racism. Stephen Gould admitted, Biological arguments for racism may have been common before 1850, but they increased by orders of magnitude following the acceptance of evolution theory. Thomas Huxley was the guy who promoted Darwin all over the country. Darwin wrote his book and went and hid. Huxley went out and really preached Darwin and made people accept what he said. 
Huxley said, no rational man, cognizant of the facts, believes that the average Negro is the equal, still less the superior of the white man. These are the guys who promoted Darwin. Uh, a guy named Kingsley, who was an Anglican priest who really promoted Darwin, also, you know, if it hadn't been for the church accepting Darwin in the 1850s and 60s, the scientists rejected it at first. They said, what a dumb theory. It was the Christians that accepted it. Kingsley said, the black people of Australia, exactly the same race as the African Negro, cannot take in the gospel. They can't get saved. He said, all attempts to bring them to a knowledge of the true God have as yet failed utterly. Poor brutes in human shape, they must perish off the face of the earth. They're inferior species. Brother, I was working in Longview, Texas at a church there. I was out two in the morning going to the store to get my wife some milk or something. I forget what it was. and I get one of the babies something at that time. And Some guy had gotten drunk and he turned his car what he, down what he thought was a street, but it was a railroad track. He drove about, you know, 30 feet and the car bottomed out and he's stuck on the tracks, you know. And he's standing out there looking at his car. What, what, what happened here, you know. He's drunk. And, so I stopped to go see what I could do to help, and another guy stopped, and we're pushing this car back off the railroad tracks before a car comes along and turns it into a tin can, you know. And uh, this guy said, what are you doing out here in the middle of the night? It was an all-black neighborhood, right by the big ghetto housing project there. I said, oh, I, well, I came by here to see if any of my friends are up, because I, I know a bunch of people here in the housing project in the, in the ghetto here, and uh, I bring a lot of these folks to church. He said, you bring them to church? I said, yeah, I drive a bus, come in here every Sunday, bring a lot of them to church. He said, these people are all black. I said, yeah, so what? He said, well, why do you bring them to church? I said, well, I try to get them saved and, you know, help them uh, learn the Bible and go just like Jesus told me to do. He said, what do you mean get them saved? They don't have souls. I said, are you part of the KKK? He said, yeah, how'd you know? Oh, just a lucky guess, you know. <laughs> well, listen, you idiot, they do have souls as much as you do. The color of your skin makes no difference. In part seven, we talk about where the races come from. There aren't any races. There's one race called the human race. Now, there are different skin colors. I can show you different skin colors of cows, too. You know, black cows, brown cows, and white cows. But they all look the same in the meat locker. <laughs> and they all taste the same on the hamburger, okay? <laughs> and all humans are the same, regardless of the color of their skin. Here's the Mormon church's teaching, though, about Negroes. The Mormon church teaches, Negroes in this life are denied the priesthood. Negroes are not equal with other races. It's the Lord's doing. It's based on His eternal laws of justice and grows out of a lack of spiritual valiance of those concerned in their first estate. When I was living over on Burgess Road, I had two Mormon missionaries come knock on my door. They said, Mr. Hoven, we'd like to talk to you about the Lord. I said, that'd be great. Which Lord would you like to talk about, yours or mine? <laughs> they said, oh, we worship the same God. I said, no, we don't. I said, tell me, fellas, does your God have a body like mine? They said, oh, yeah. I said, well, my Bible says God's a spirit, and they that worship Him must worship Him in spirit and in truth. See, if He has a body, He can only be in one place at a time. But if He's a spirit, He can be in all places at all times, simultaneously. I said, does your God live on the planet Kolob, K-O-L-O-B? They said, yeah, we believe He does. I said, does your God have thousands of wives? They said, yeah, we believe He does. 